fusing the nitrogen atoms in the air into magnesium. The reaction would quickly- I'm sorry, what? Hi, <laughs> I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at a video called Oppenheimer's Apocalypse Math by Welch Labs. I think this has something to do with the thought that, hey, maybe detonating an atomic bomb could destroy the Earth somehow. I've heard a few stories about that. Let's check it out. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. Near <laughs> Love the confidence. Near zero. It's probably fine. Kind of reminds me of when the uh, Large Hadron Collider research was first being developed. And they're like, eh, we're pretty sure it's not going to cause a black hole that's going to destroy the world. <laughs> Bit of humor there. Obviously, they were really sure. Zero. What do you want from theory alone? This is the mathematics that Oppenheimer and his team used to check if the first nuclear bomb test would end up destroying the entire world. The fear was that the extreme temperature from the blast would trigger a thermonuclear reaction in the atmosphere fusing the nitrogen atoms in the air into magnesium. The reaction would quickly- I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> Causing fusion, huh? Okay, if you're gonna try fusioning of nitrogen, you're gonna need crazy, crazy conditions. I don't even think you can do that on the sun. It's just not big enough star, big enough fusion reaction to do that. So fusion, you need three basic things. You need a lot of heat, a lot of pressure, or gravity in the case of the sun, and a lot of time, a lot of confinement time, if you will, to induce this uh, fusion reaction. So a nuclear bomb, um, they have a good bit of heat. You know, we're talking on the order of millions of degrees Fahrenheit. Um, time, though, no. <laughs> no, none of the time. These reactions take place on the order of nanoseconds, so not enough time to really to really do anything. And keep in mind, these atomic bombs did not incorporate fusion as part of their design. Even if they did, it wouldn't be nearly enough to fuse something like nitrogen. Nitrogen is super heavy to try to fuse using anything on Earth. We're talking fusing um, hydrogen into helium or even certain isotopes of lithium to do that, but... Uh-uh, that's, that's not going to be nearly enough. And as far as the pressure, you're not forcing anything in. The device is actually exploding outward, so you don't, you're not going to have the conditions necessary to, uh, to cause fusions. But I think this is one of those outlandish assumptions they made in this calculation, just to prove a point. Spread across the globe, turning the atmosphere into a plasma, destroying <laughs> the Earth and all of its inhabitants. <laughs> For the reaction to spread, the energy produced from nuclear fusion in a given region needs to exceed the energy lost within that region. The energy produced by the reaction depends on the density of nitrogen in the atmosphere, the probability of nuclear fusion, and the energy released per reaction. That blue number right there, super, super low number. Atomic density of nitrogen, I mean, there's a good bit of nitrogen in the air, but probability of fusing nitrogen is, is insane. And energy released per fusion, well, I just don't see how you, you're, you're not gonna get there. Not, not, not on Earth, not in the sun, in larger stars um, that are further along their, their life cycle, then yeah, you, you, you could generate kind of that, because you have all that gravity, all that pressure, everything is packed so tightly together, so that atomic density is gonna be enormous. The probability you're surrounded by everything in this big fusion reactor and energy released, sure. So you can get that, you can get there under certain conditions, ain't happening on Earth. But they had no experimental data for the probability of nitrogen atoms fusing. They assumed the worst case possibility, mm. that every collision would result in fusion. No. <laughs> that is a crazy, crazy assumption. But I can see why they did that. Um, in nuclear engineering, there's some crazy math involved. Um, for those of you who have seen my uh, animation versus math video, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, one plus one equals two for your typical mathematician. 
But a nuclear engineer is going to say 1 plus 1 equals 100 because that's how many safety margins we throw into all of our calculations, all of our designs, just to be sure nothing crazy like this happens. So this is an example of some crazy nuclear engineering binding math, which I guess makes sense in the context. Hey, let's talk about another crazy nuclear math scenario that I face during my career. First off, just going to throw this disclaimer up there. Not using real numbers, can't use real numbers, but this is mainly just an illustration. So, Fukushima, that happened in 2011, fairly early into my career. Those of you who are not familiar, massive earthquake and tsunami, completely cut off all power supplies for decay heat removal systems at this nuclear power plant, which ultimately resulted in fuel damage or a meltdown, as people who are not in the industry tend to call these things. So. How do we stop one of these and design our current nuclear power plants to give them enough margin so that this sort of thing won't happen again? First off, you make this scenario even harder. You make crazy assumptions. So you lose all power immediately after shutdown, so you have a bunch of nice fresh decay heat, the maximum amount of decay heat to work with. And let's go ahead and get rid of all those pesky safety water tanks immediately, too, that can support um, safe cooling and shutdown. And yeah, let's just let's just make the scenario harder. So all we have left is the essential cooling water pond to uh, safely provide a heat sink for the reactor. Step two, you exaggerate the numbers. <laughs> Essential cooling water temperature, let's say for this plant, the highest recorded temperature is 90 degrees. The operational limit, 99 degrees. Tech spec limit, 101 degrees. The updated final safety analysis report limit, 103 degrees. And so we're going to assume it's 110 degrees just to give ourselves even more margin. 1 plus 1 equals 100 territory, remember? And 20 degrees for a change in water from going from highest recorded to this assumption that is a massive amount of energy difference we are talking about in that water and a lot of potential uh, decay heat removal that we're just not going to have based on this assumption just to make it even harder. Oh, and we're going to assume the water gets nasty somehow. The silt concentration is a thousand times that of normal, so it's... This water is ultimately going to uh, clog up our, our piping and become unusable at some point. And then we solve. So we use a decay heat curve, some modeling software, something like that. And we typically end up with something like six months before loss of cooling to the reactor core while it's shut down. And this is assuming we basically did nothing for six months. No bringing in alternative sources of water. No repairs were done. We went six months without electric power somehow. So pretty, pretty crazy assumptions. And then you present it. You present it to your executive team with confidence and with all this margin that you showed in our design that, hey, we have a robust design at our nuclear power plant that can withstand even amongst the most crazy scenarios. That's kind of what um, Oppenheimer and his team did when they did that calculation. Next, Oppenheimer's team computed the energy lost as the reaction proceeded. At the, at the incredibly high temperatures required for fusion... Let's go. Are those marbles they used to make to show the electrons and the nucleus to, I guess, show what it's going to look like to make it into plasma? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Electrons break free of their atoms, forming a plasma. As electrons are slowed by interactions with the sea of ions, they release significant amounts of radiation known as That's Bremsstrahlung, cool. or breaking radiation. The amount of energy released depends on the charge of the ions. In this case, Z equals 7 for nitrogen, and the average velocity of the electrons, including relativistic effects due to the high speeds involved. Oppenheimer's team had reasonable estimates for these values, computing electron velocity using the energy transfer rate from nuclei to electrons. Using these equations, they obtained a second curve, showing the energy lost as a function of temperature. Now, in theory, by comparing these two curves, we can figure out if the world is going to explode or not. I love it. Uh, your, class, your classic example of a bounding calculation that's crazy outlandish assumptions just to, just to prove a point. And I can see why they did this calculation. If for any achievable temperature, the energy produced is greater than the energy lost, the reaction will become self-sustaining and spread across the globe. 
Fortunately for Oppenheimer's team, the loss curve is greater than the production curve across all possible temperatures. Yeah, self-sustaining for something as wide and as sparsely populated as the atmosphere. I mean, yeah, the, the math makes sense, but the physics is like, all right, I'm going to see how you're just trying to figure out how, how you're going to get there. Uh, spoiler, you, you don't. Around 10 mega electron volts, the margin of safety becomes only 1.6, meaning that if scientists underestimated the gains by just 60%, the outcome would be completely different. You over, they overestimated the games by about a trillion percent. <laughs> That's what really happened. <laughs> but to be fair, they had an unknown, so you're gonna at least do some of these things to try to figure it out and at least foster a discussion to see, you know, what further refinements you can make to the test to ensure even this crazy scenario doesn't happen. Electron volts are a measure of energy, not temperature. But it's convenient in plasma physics to express temperature in this way. That's what Oppenheimer's team is doing here. We can convert degrees Kelvin using the Boltzmann constant. So that's a unit of energy, a very small one, macroscopic uh, or microscopic scale. But we're talking this is per, per atom that you're fusing kind of thing, which is a lot. To give you a sense of another thing, energy from chemical bonds used, say, during uh, coal or natural gas, you're talking just electron volts, maybe a few hundred electron volts per, um, per molecule that you're talking about. Here, we're talking about millions of them. Another number is you get about 200 mega electron volts from uh, fissioning uh, uranium-235 in a typical nuclear power plant. Nuclear bombs release huge amounts of energy, but for the air to reach these incredibly high temperatures, that energy has to be transferred to air particles. The most significant transfer mechanism is collision with high energy alpha particles released by the explosion. And when you're relying on something like that versus typical macroscopic energy transfer through things like conduction or convection, you'll see that the energy released is on such a small scale at such close range, this sort of thing isn't gonna happen. That brings me the whole, the whole question of pressure and confinement time that I discussed earlier. It takes on average 57 meters for an alpha particle to collide with a nitrogen nucleus. This means that the volume of yeah. air required for the bomb to efficiently transfer energy is large, roughly a sphere of 57 meters. Heating a sphere of this size to 10 mega electron volts requires an enormous amount of energy, around 100,000 times more energy than would be released by the fission bombs Oppenheimer's team was designing. It's also going to have to stay there for a while. So even larger nuclear weapons like the SAR bomber that are on the order of megatons of energy, they get closer. They're not 100,000 times more powerful, but that's still not going to get you there. That's going to get you one requirement of causing fusion, not fusion. A 1959 article in American Weekly incorrectly claimed that scientists computed a slightly less than 3 in 1 million probability that the world was going to end, giving them the confidence to move forward. Hans Bethe, a key That's an overestimate, too. ...member of Oppenheimer's team, responded in an essay, stating that this was never a matter of probabilities and that ignition is simply impossible. Ultimately, this mathematics convinced Compton, Oppenheimer, and the rest of the Los Alamos scientists that the bomb they were building would not destroy the world. So there you have it. A couple of examples of some crazy nuclear engineering math. By the way, if you're taking a test right now that involves arithmetic, I don't recommend doing this on those sort of tests. You might just get some weird look from, uh, from your teachers. <laughs> Let me know what you think about throwing all kinds of margin to basically make 1 plus 1 equals 100. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.